Hey guys, it's Chris Bircher, Knowledge Plus Experience Equals Wisdom. This is my Curiosity Interview Series, number seven, with Dan Tesson. And Dan came to me a little bit differently. He is a friend of a friend, and uh, I really uh, wanted to interview my buddy Willie, and we just had some Willie Bryan. You'll hear us talk about him a little bit in this interview. Uh, one of my best friends in the whole world, and we just couldn't make it work out uh, time-wise. And uh, he knows Dan Tesson, the interviewee today, and was just like, dude, this is one of the most curious guys I've ever known. Hey, you might want to check him out just for a different angle, um, and maybe this is going to work out. And I just thought, sure, of course, obviously, this is the thing. <laughs> and Dan was uh, open. And it's it's interesting because unlike most of my, the first six interviews, I guess maybe, no, pretty much all of them uh, have an interest in um, uh, promoting themselves or maybe like Paul Godall, the first one, he's currently writing a book, and he's got some some bigger things coming in the future. And uh, although he doesn't have a platform, um, you know, the interview series is good for him because it's it's what he does, talking about these subjects like curiosity. And everybody else has some sort of a social media platform, website, product to sell, or something like that, or coaching. Um, and so Dan has none of that. <laughs> there will be no social media links in the blog uh, unless you want to hunt him down on Facebook and, and be friends with him. But um, he's just a regular guy. Kind of interesting, w- w- being in the time of a pandemic, he is a pharmacist, but not in the way that you think. And we talk about this, but I'll give you a little bit of heads up. He's a hospitalist pharmacist and works at a hospital, and he's got a really crazy way of how he came about, came into it, rather than most pharmacists sort of going to pharmacy school and then right on to the retail pharmacy chain uh, career path. Uh, Dan did some really interesting things, and he knows a lot about um, COVID and vaccines, and he's done a lot of that work, and, he, and, he, and it's a great lesson. There's about five or ten minutes of this interview where he will explain to you how the vaccines work, what CRISPR is, and some other cool stuff. But more than that, this interview, to me, illustrates that you know everybody's curious. It isn't just about leveraging curiosity for some goal, but that we have an innate or some of us, and I think all of us at a young age, and and some of us carry this into adulthood, are driven by this curiosity, and Dan's is infectious. Um, And so it's it's a really neat um, derivation of these curiosity interviews, and I think sort of represents um, another facet of human curiosity. And uh, I really enjoyed meeting Dan. It's, It's one of these things where if you ran into him at a bar or in the grocery store or whatever your thing is, and you just sort of um, ended up in a conversation with him or behind him in line or something and asked what he did, you'd be there for an hour because you would be, um, his curiosity is infectious. And so it would, it would come into you. And I, and I don't know, at least that was my experience. And I hope, hopefully you have a similar one. And so it is my pleasure to uh, introduce you to Dan Tassone. And I hope that you enjoy the Knowledge Plus Experience Equals Wisdom Curiosity Interview number seven. And uh, as always, I appreciate appreciate you guys, and uh, I hope you enjoy. Thanks. Cool. How do you tell? Pronounce your last name. Does it pronounce like it sounds? Yeah, it's Tassone. Just like Um, some people say Tassoni. Some people (laughs) say Tassone. Tassone. Yeah, Tassone. I've, I've heard all of that before. Well, yeah, I don't. I mean, Bircher is not a very common name, and most of the time people freeze. Yeah, know, just because they're just afraid. Butcher it. Oh, sweet Legos! I dig it. Yeah, this is. Um, we just redid my son's room over the over the COVID summer. Yeah, and, uh, he he just turned thirteen, so we uh, got all the Legos out of his room, but. You know, there's a rule in the house. If we have a Lego that's more than fifty dollars, then we're gonna craggle it. I mean, we're gonna like not take it <laughs> apart. Craggle. <laughs> and this is the, the Lego room right now. Right. That that's awesome. Office. That's cool. Right. Well, yeah. Th- thanks for doing this. It's so funny because Brian just has a way of like. Uh, I mean, he told me a long time ago. He's like, I know who you should interview. <laughs> and then, you know, time went by. But uh, yeah. I can already tell. I can already tell you. Got, you and I would get along well. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Yeah, he was that's telling a... me all about you. So, oh, great. Now, yeah. where, where do you live at? I'm in Abingdon, which um, even as a Virginian, you may not know where that is. <laughs> I, yes, I do know where that's oh, at awesome. because I was looking for vaccines for my mother, and that's on the far 
very corner of the western part of the state, isn't it? Yeah, yeah for, uh, for uh, Tennessee is like 10 minutes. North yeah. Carolina is probably 15. Uh huh. Yeah, as the crow flies, West Virginia and Kentucky are close, but you got to go through mountains and coal fields to get there, so it takes forever. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> but I lived in I lived in Richmond for I went to VCU, got my master's at uh -huh. VCU, and uh, obviously Brian and I knew each other in Blacksburg years ago. Yeah, yeah. And how do you guys know, know each other? Um, from living in the, the same neighborhood. Oh yeah, um, okay. So we've he he had a lot of pig pickings where we would yeah. stay up all night. And we'd like cook the pig <laughs> and flip the pig, so it was. And then the next day we were just <laughs> feeling like crap, <laughs> you know, drinking too much and hanging yeah. out way too long. Yes. But so, that is, that's, that's the God that seems like forever ago with COVID. I mean, yeah, it just seems yeah. like that doesn't, it's so weird. Yeah. I've heard those stories, uh, yeah. you know, of the pig pickings and I've been to this house a few times and mm -hmm. yeah. But, um, you know, I don't know how much you know about this or don't, but, um, I do this podcast just because I'm yeah. most of the time it's just me, but uh, yeah. a dude, a, a dude um, reached out to me one time, like by the first person that ever like got in touch with me about it. And mm -hmm. he said, your podcast makes me curious. And we yeah. talked about that for a while. And I thought, I bet that'd be cool just to like meet people for the first time. Sometimes knowing something about them, sometimes not right. and just, and just see where that goes. Being yeah. informed, being informed by sort of, you know, your context, like who you are uh -huh. and what you do and all yeah. that stuff. Um, yeah, but that, that's it. <laughs> yeah. And I think I, I, I released the third one Friday and I think you'll mm -hmm. be number seven. Okay. Context. That's great. No, I think it's a great idea because you just let it go to, you know, where it goes and who knows where it's going to go. Yeah. Like when, you know, I, Brian, um, when I called him, I was like, will you just help me practice? I've never done a zoom and recorded it to see how it's all going to uh -huh. work out and that one it, you know he he actually he'd had a few beers and he said a few things he he didn't want necessarily to go public yeah <laughs> but i was like i'm gonna release this one <laughs> but it's, it's just because because we were just shooting the shit i mean it's just yeah so, uh and uh and with covid and where i am i mean you know how are you going to meet new people in a county of forty thousand people you know after 10 years i kind of know everybody right right <laughs> yeah it's just, a whole uh, different it's, world it's tough well so so just if you can give me some of your i mean you told me uh you know I, my first wife was a pharmacist so when i think of pharmacy oh I great think of, of cvs but you do uh -huh. not that <laughs> right, right? you're not a retail so why don't you if you can tell us a little bit about what you do you know that okay help help people contextualize who you are great well no I've been out of pharmacy school now since 2004. Um, but even at that time, there was really a push for pharmacists to do residencies, which is an extra year of uh, specialty training, usually in a hospital or, or out in the community. And after that, you can go and keep on training to learn to specialize in something. So pharmacy school right now is typically having three years or a whole undergrad degree. I have a, a chemistry degree and then um, moved on to pharmacy, which was an additional four years. I did a residency program here in Richmond at the VA, um, the Hunter Holmes McGuire VA. Uh, and that was mostly in diabetes management and blood pressure management, all these chronic disease state managements. Um, I wanted to teach after doing my residency. Mm -hmm. So I went to Wingate, North Carolina. Oh, There's yeah. a small pharmacy school there. Uh, I taught there. I helped that school open up. It didn't even have an, an actual graduating class yet. Uh, so my first job was to start a, a clinic uh, and then uh, to treat patients and then also teach the neurology lecture series to the pharmacy students, which was not my, my strong point, but yeah. <laughs> I had to learn along the way and come up with a, you know, a, a, a 20 uh, class um, lecture series. And uh, that was a challenge, but uh, yeah. got it done. Um, <laughs> then VCU opened up its satellite campus in Northern Virginia. 
that's my alma mater. Uh, so I helped that program start a satellite campus with the Inova Fairfax Hospital. And that's where I got into infectious disease. I had started a practice up there uh, in an infectious disease clinic, um, seeing HIV patients and um, viral uh, hepatology type patients and really getting to know that that population uh, was really rewarding to me. Then we moved back down here to Richmond, Virginia, where I got into the HIV and infectious disease clinic back in 2010. Uh, I see uh, HIV patients in our clinic uh, once or twice a week. I helped treat over 1,200 uh, hepatitis C patients and cured 96% of them wow, uh, with crap. these great new drugs. Uh, and now with the coronavirus and being an infectious disease pharmacist, I've helped the medical teams pick the regimens to treat our patients. Um, I, I'm more like an advisor. I get calls from medical teams about what kind of antibiotic should we use for this patient for this type of infection? Is that drug gonna have good penetration into the brain or to the lungs? Do we have to worry about the patient's kidney function and dose it appropriately? And now I'm also helping with the vaccine clinic at our hospital um, and with the rollout of that. And actually at times pulling up doses and give yeah. them uh, to our providers to give to patients. So I think I've seen COVID from the very beginning to you know, now the, the the light at the end of the tunnel. And it's, it's, it's amazing because, and I see this is how this curiosity is, conversation is going to go, but <laughs> um, I've just kind of seen the entire spectrum uh, over the last year. And that's been very rewarding to me, but can you imagine living in a world that is your specialty? Let's say if your specialty or, or you love music, but music is, your, your job is 24 seven. All your friends are asking you about music. All your family is asking you about music. You gotta come home and play music even when you're not playing out on stage. You have to think about music all the time. And if you're passionate about something, yeah, that's good. But at the same time, I'm starting to feel a little bit tired because every <laughs> night before I go to bed, I have to read about a new drug that came out or another study. When I wake up in the morning, I have to look at my phone and see what's going on because damn it, somebody is going to ask me by the end of the day, what do I wow. think about this or that? So it feels like the spotlight is on you 100% of the time. And um, that could be taxing, but it's also very um, um, invigorate. It's you, you're just always on and you're learning something new every day and you're using it right then and there every day in, in real time. So. Yeah, that's, that wow. is fascinating. I mean, that, that, and well, and that, what you just said, we could take off in a completely different direction that has nothing to do with COVID Yeah, because that whole idea of if you do what you love, you'll never work a day in your life. But right. The thought, but the thought of even doing what I love, like take music as a good example, all the time. Yeah. <laughs> you know, at some point, and, and I think that links back into curiosity, like, do you find that when you look at your phone this morning and say something interesting, you know, the governor of Texas now says we're cured, you know, right. Does that, does uh -huh. that still trigger curiosity or is that triggering some, some other emotion? Yeah. No, that's a bad example, but I mean, I know, a, no, a new, yes, a new yes. drug. <laughs> but that, but that's, that's funny that you say that because um, maybe someone who has a political career and they have to stay up on top of things, how something can make them so angry. Uh, and I do get angry on a daily basis from some of the things that I hear and, um, and how misinformed some people are. And that's frustrating to me. And I know that would be frustrating to you because you really are a person, uh, we're like-minded that we wanna empower people with knowledge. So that way they can make logical, smart decisions that will just not be good for them, but good for, for everybody. And there's just not a lot of that 
you know, <laughs> going around. This has really taught us that there's a problem with humanity. And <laughs> I really don't have a lot of hope for humanity right well, now. Well, it, it is funny how COVID is this like shined this light on, you know, I, and I think I did an episode on this and I tried to couch it in a positive way. What have we learned from COVID? But certainly yeah. I think one of the things we've learned is that, you know, I, my background is science. I've got a, you know, ecology yeah. background, multiple mm -hmm. degrees. So I, yeah. I fundamentally believe in that as a useful tool. And then to see <laughs> how it is treated by the public. And for you, you know, yeah. here's, here's someone that's trying to help the human race. I mean, yeah. I don't think that's, yeah. a, I don't think that's an exaggeration all the way down to the individual. And then, I mean, it's like you're handing out food to the homeless or something. And they're like, no, I, I don't want that. I want fries or, you know, give me yeah. a bottle and of liquor. How, how's that? It, <laughs> it, it is just simply how do you package your message for, for anything? Sometimes you, I feel just like a used car salesman. Now, one example is we do heart transplants now uh, at the hospital with the heart has come from a person who died that had hepatitis C. And we give that heart that has maybe a little bit of hepatitis C into it to a person who needs that heart that doesn't have hepatitis C. So I tell this patient, I say, hey, you can get a heart sooner if you take this heart that has hepatitis C and then I'm gonna treat you right away. And I have about a 99% chance of curing that hepatitis C that we just gave you. Um, and to package it in a certain way that they're gonna understand is just so rewarding. And the same thing goes with the vaccine now. So many people say, I don't want it, it's so new. I mean, I'm just, I don't get upset at them and just wanna educate them and say, hey, this is your chance. This is like liquid gold and we're offering this to you. Uh, and trying to open up their eyes so that they can understand the science and make that good decision for themselves is, uh, you know, one of my major goals every day. Well, that's pretty awesome because I mean, I find that my scientific background has, hasn't made me, um, that, uh, I don't know what the word is patient. Maybe like, yeah. I don't want to, I don't want to have to go through the marketing exercise. I, I just, yeah. well, and I don't, and I'm saying it all, all the time, but I guess, and maybe I'm blaming other scientists for this because the academics I was around certainly had that attitude. Look, here's mm -hmm. the paper I published. You right. go read it. Yeah. And I always thought, mm, I think we have some responsibility to somehow communicate this in a different way, mm -hmm. <laughs> but, but, but most of the people I was around didn't have that. Um, yeah, you know, they, they just put up, I don't, I don't know. So that's cool that you take that extra step. Do you see that your colleagues or the people you work with, do they have that sort of mindset or are they of the, you know, read the paper? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or, I, I, I feel like that you, you can think of your own, um, visits to the doctors over the, you know, the last several years. They're just people who have better bedside manner than others. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Right. And really doing that's called the, you know, the, the translational science, that there's a whole field in that, taking it from the bench to the clinic and then to explaining it to people. So clinicians and the, the public will yeah. use that information. So, um, but yeah, no, there's, there's patients in the HIV clinic. They're like, I don't want to see that provider today. Uh, because, you know, they rub me the wrong way or, or <laughs> yeah. you know, they, they just kind of tell me what to do. Like with your ex-wife being a, a pharmacist, she probably, you know, the big thing is, well, did you take your medication today or not? And there's two methods about that. You either have the compliant, uh, are you compliant or are you adherent? And compliant means did you take your medication yeah. and you're, you're acting like a drill sergeant to the person and they're going to be mm. like scared compared to adherence. That's more so like working with the patient and saying, well, what kind of barriers do you have to taking your medication? And that's the lane that I like to travel. Yeah, it's sure. trying to figure out, you know, what's going on with the key of being, you know, empathetic and 
really trying to, to solve what, what are the barriers for educating your patients and, and the public? Well, it sounds like that might be because you're curious, you know, trying mm -hmm. to figure out the way to do this versus somebody who just says they should know <laughs> or, or, yeah. or whatever. I mean, that's, I wonder to, I, and so one of the things I, I ask every guest is, you know, what role do you think that curiosity has played on you becoming, you know, a, a professional caregiver? I, I don't know what your yeah. pharmacist, pharmacist sounds way, yeah. you know, below your pay grade. You sound like you do it's, a lot more. <laughs> than I, just... <laughs> I am, I'm a, a, cl a clinical pharmacy specialist, um, but by trade, I'm a proud pharmacist and proud of the uh, the profession, the, the most trusted profession <laughs> yeah. out there. Well, that's another um, element too, that you, you guys, I think doctors and pharmacy, you do have that bedside manner and that is actually mm -hmm. part of your training, right? I mean, you yeah. actually have to have some of this. So yeah, yeah. Not all the sciences have that. <laughs> but the, yeah, we do spend some time um, doing that kind of stuff our communication skills. But really when, it, when I think about curiosity and what led me into the, the profession is just it's, I always knew um, that I loved science. Um, even before I could really read, I would pick up the National Geographics uh, that, that we had around the house and I would pretend that I was like reading them with my finger. <laughs> and That's cool. of course, um, um, Cosmos would, would come on as a kid and we would uh, watch that, me and my older brothers, uh, and that had a lot of influence. So science in general has always been my curiosity, you know, always questioning, you know, why do things really work? Uh, and, you know, it's, and I guess I've, I always wanted to discover something as well, and that's my my curiosity too to to find that that big discovery that you know these scientists make. But now it's just so dang hard because it seems like everybody discovered everything <laughs> out there. <laughs> yeah. So or you got to get like a you got to look think look at things at a um, microscopic level right now or, or quantum level to actually yeah. uh, like discover anything new. Um, but really, that, that's what it is. Just my, my love and passion for science and all sciences had, le had led me here to, to, you know, where I'm at today. Um. Well, it's good. It's cool to, to understand that side of pharmacy because my, my first wife, mm -hmm. literally all, all I ever saw was, the, was a retail. You know, I always thought, wow, she, yeah. just, she might as well be selling car parts. Yeah. Know? it's the same job, but that's, you know, working for a major chain and, and doing that right. grind. But my, and she was, but, she was probably pulling her hair out because yeah, there's a lot of insurance and uh, yeah, it's just mostly business. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. everybody's yelling at you. <laughs> well, and now my, my, my wife, current wife, I, I don't know what uh -huh. to call, I mean, my wife, you know, yeah, she, your wife, uh, yeah. she, she's an anesthesiologist and mm -hmm. uh, all of a sudden I see her profession kind of take going that direction. I don't know if you have yeah. this and what you do, but oh yeah. She's she's burning out on well, let's see if I can say this the right way. I mean, her job used to be 80% her job and 20% mm -hmm. BS admin notes, yeah. whatever. And now I'd say that's flipped. You know, 20% yeah. of what she does is her job, what she went to school for, what she's curious about, what she's good at, and this weight of all of this so, it, I mean, I'm not saying she's um, a, a used or a car parts saleswoman, but it's a different, it's not the job. I mean, I don't understand. Yeah. Um, do you experience that too at these different places that you work? Like the, I mean, the VA and the yeah, universities. What's, what's really fortunate about my job is that it's so specialized that my boss or no one really knows exactly what I really do, which gives me the freedom to be like, I'm curious or I'm interested about how that data looks. And then I'll collect data, I'll put it in an Excel spreadsheet. I'm like, this looks like something that we could do like a small project on. Oh. And, um, you know, we'll start gathering data and do the pilot project and see if we could make changes in maybe how the providers are prescribing antibiotics or, you know, 
maybe this is causing more diarrhea in people. And me having that freedom and that leeway to look and be curious uh, about different things is ex you know, extremely important to my job satisfaction. And that's why I'll never leave this, this specific job because I feel like I get to do what I want uh, in that, along with my other activities that are required yeah, and answering questions here and there. I'm just not sitting at my computer yeah. Like, all right, what am I going to do today? You know, I have all well, this spare time. But. Well, I can totally appreciate it. I can, I know exactly what you're talking about. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, I've never figured out how people find their way into those types of positions where you literally can sort of follow yeah. your passion or your curiosity into whatever and still benefit, you know, yeah. the company or your role or, 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 or you're serving. Um, that's amazing. That's congratulations. Yeah. That's huge. Yeah. The Part of that is I'm much like you. I, I was not a uh, big team player. I mean, I was on the wrestling team, which is more of an individual sport or, you know, doing Taekwondo or, you know, my sports were more like an individual and mm -hmm. I tend to work better, you know, by myself. And uh, compared to having to deal with a lot of people or manage a lot of people, then you lose that ability to you know, kind of do what you want. Yeah, you know, no, that's, uh, that's thing awesome. Going on. Cause yeah, some... Oh, I'm done. Yeah. Thanks. But well, no, I mean, somebody told me, yeah. I remember getting kind of uh, chastised by one of my committee members and saying, you know, you're a learn, you're a lone wolf and yeah. you can't do that anymore in, uh -huh. this, in academia. You've got to figure out how to play on teams. And I remember just being crushed, like, yeah. No, 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 no. That's not the job I wanted, you know, eight yeah. years ago when I started this uh -huh. career, I wanted to, you know, I don't want other people getting in my way or uh, right. I don't know. That's, that's pretty, that's pretty amazing that, you know, the, do you think somebody recognized that in you or was that the position and they hired you for it or did it just sort of develop because, you know, like a high, was it your personality or yeah. was it the, was it the job? Right. Well, Previously, we didn't have an infectious disease job at the hospital. I was hired originally um, to get on an RV and work with a small team to go to the uh, six different Native American tribes around Richmond and help with wow. primary care. So we'd get out there early in the morning, wow. I'd help set up the RV, and they would call me the Chickahominy, the Eastern Chickahominy, the Mattapanai. Uh, uh, few of them would say, oh, here comes the medicine man, just as a joke, you wow, know, because they knew that's... I was like <laughs> the pharmacist. So it was, that was more of a short-lived project, uh, but that, that was really great to get out in that community. But during my spare time, I would offer to work in the HIV clinic. And then I said, well, we should go ahead and move forward with this position. And so I, that, I got to turn it into to what I wanted to uh, along the way, um, which was... Um, which was great. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's good. But 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 you had you know you you can't just that's not passive, right? I mean, you had a vision for it. I mean, you yeah. knew what to turn it into too. That's right. Uh, because right. I you, I mean, the way if you if you generalize sort of your statement about what you do, and maybe you know tweaked it a little bit for the details, it sounds like a dream job to me, and yeah. I'm sure to, to yeah. tons of other people. Um, yeah. But. You know, I guess some people are satisfied uh, selling car parts. <laughs> hey, I, I don't think so. I don't know how. Um, well, so so I just met this dude uh, through LinkedIn, which is, you know, all, all, my whole life in the last six months from doing this these interviews, really, I've, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. people have turned me on to new things, and LinkedIn is one of them. And I've, yeah. and I've met a couple people on there, and there's a guy on there who um, whose mission and well. How do I say this without, you know, taking up all your time? He, um, right. he, he got fed up with the rat race, so to speak. He was in science academia for 30 years. Right. And then one day decided I'm going to sort of take a sabbatical, give up mm -hmm. cell phone, give up all media, give up all contact with people and sort of do this three year isolation meditation. And he came out yeah. of that with this mission that says, you know, and anyone who's not doing the job that they like you and your job, anybody who doesn't uh -huh. have this relationship with their job needs to quit. 
yeah right right now and do something mm -hmm. else and uh, but we can't all do that <laughs> no no we yeah we if you have young kids a family i mean it, it, it makes it difficult but that that's what it seems like i mean life is so short you should just get up and do what you need to do actually when i was leaving work today um a vet there was someone who did die in the hospital uh, and I leave through the basement and I saw the body, you know, rolling past me, uh, today to the, to the hearse. And, you know, I try to take a second, uh, to pay my respects, but at the same time, then you, you know, you question your own, uh, mortality there and you say, you know, is this a good day? Am I doing what I should be doing? Uh, and just like your friend on wow. LinkedIn, he's like, well, time is really short. <laughs> You know, let's not waste it uh, because we're all going to be there someday. Yeah, uh, that, that, that's exactly it's that's it's funny where, how, how we arrive there because that's exactly where I am is sort of and, and I look at my wife, you know, mm -hmm. both of us, you spend 12 years doing this thing, you finally get the thing and the, either the thing changes or you change yeah. or just the the huh. oh, that's funny. Because you've got, I'll cut this out. Because you've got, oh. we've got three people on. Zoom has a forty-minute limit. Uh, oh no! Well, oh, but no, we, I, I mean, that. okay. Uh, we, right. uh, we can just we can just start it over if it if it cuts us okay. off. I just got a little message. Right. Um, but so uh, yeah, so my you know, and I, I I quit academia really to be a stay-at-home dad. Uh huh. Because I was we were burning the candle at both ends. Two professionals. Yeah. It just didn't work for me. Yeah, but um, now I sort of, but I'm, I was also burning out on the job. I mean, uh -huh. it's just, it wasn't. But my, I watched my wife do this with medicine. Now you know she's. I mean, she yeah. is ar arguably not no bias. She is an awesome doctor. She's uh -huh. just in, incredible. But she she hates her job. Yeah, <laughs> it, yeah. Be, because of what it's become, and so yeah, I watch her, and I'm like, you really need to change something. I don't, it's I don't not, know. It's not worth it. Yeah. Working 12 it's, hour days and, and the call schedule. I mean, I think she did the math. It's something like over the next 10 days or something, she's working something like 90. It's just, it's ridiculous. Yeah. <clears throat> but I mean, what do you do? I mean, because I'm the hippie guy on the one side going, just uh -huh. quit. We'll be okay. Yeah. But like you said, when you, like we got four kids and, and, you know, how do you, how do you drag everybody else into that trip? <laughs> yeah. You, it, ta it takes some, some math, but um, it's, <laughs> yeah. it's important. And if you have, you know, a spouse or a partner that is on board with it and everybody's on board, then yeah, you have to take care of, of yourself. And um, we only live once, but that kind of goes back to, to this job that I'm in right now. It's, very intense. I'm working it extremely hard, but again, since it's something that I like, I'm I'm okay with working hard. Yeah, I'm okay with staying late, and I'm okay with with and definitely okay with helping uh, the patients and the population. Um, but who knows if that's going to last forever? There's one thing that I hate, though. Is I hate yeah uh, a job that just seems like it's the same thing every day. <laughs> oh man. Uh, yeah. And I start getting idle hands and I feel like, you know, it, it, that just seems like it get, can get you in trouble. I wonder if that's a, a, a artifact of being a curious person. I remember when I worked mm -hmm. in a pet store, it sounds pretty benign, but I, mean, I learned a lot working at the pet store and I liked it. But one day I literally was just staring out the window and I thought to myself, there's nothing that's going to happen today that hasn't already happened. Yeah, I've literally, I've yeah. literally seen, and there's a lot of shit you can see in the pet industry. Uh -huh. Yeah, <laughs> be, and and I literally, I just had that. I knew with all of me that that was a true statement, and and yeah. that's the, you know, quickly thereafter, I found something else to do instead of yeah, that, because I knew well, it wasn't going to give me anything or. Yeah, I I kind of feel like most pharmacists and a lot of scientists, uh, they might be a type personality. Uh, I'm definitely not. I think I'm like a. Z type personality. <laughs> if you put instructions in front of me, mentally, I have a, a problem dealing with that. I, I'm a kind of person <laughs> that I just have to do it myself. 
And by doing it myself, I'm going to get it wrong the first couple of times. Um, but man, I have a fun time like making those mistakes and I learned so much uh, along the way. But if I'm working with others though, then that's kind of difficult because they see it as chaos. So I feel like in my mind, I bring chaos to the world and can mix things up, but that doesn't work so great <laughs> in healthcare because I don't want to kill anybody. Uh, there's not much room for error there. Um, but um, well, I can relate to that. We make mistakes. I, I can relate to that a thousand percent. And my wife is super type A and uh, we yeah. talk about this all the time. It's like we compliment each other so well because she does uh -huh. rein in a little bit of my chaos. Yeah. And I, you know, open up a little bit of her, yeah. Or, so I don't know how that's going to work with her job, but yeah, <laughs> we're on a, that's a basically, well, and basically we've decided my third daughter, there's 10 years between my third and fourth. So when the third mm -hmm. daughter goes to college, we're going to, we're, we're trying to make a move now so that we'll be able to, for her to quit uh, and figure right, out, right. figure out something else. Yeah. And I guess that's what people do is you, yeah. you say, well, we can't just, you know, clean break because of all this right machine right. the battleship but um yeah we'll try something no, but one is. thing i wanted to ask you and and may, and that maybe this is like moving the conversation in a bad direction but i'm so, uh -huh. i'm so um amazed or impressed by this crispr thing um and and oh, that's i was, was going to talk about that actually yeah. Awesome. Well, they, they go for it. Cause, and I'll just say my sort of understanding, somebody came up to me and said, you know, I, I got the second, I've had, I'm, I'm fully vaccinated. I've had two rounds of uh -huh. Pfizer and okay. uh, somebody else was talking. I got so sick and I was like, how could you get sick? They didn't put any virus in you. Like how are people having right. side effects? But I guess any, anyway, uh -huh. so it's not, some people might not know that it isn't a dead virus that you're getting, right? Well, well, actually it is. Um, ah. So CRISPR technology is something that's completely different from what's going on with these vaccines. So uh -huh. if we're gonna talk about the mRNA vaccine versus the Johnson & Johnson vaccine or the, um, you know, Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine. Those are called viral vector vaccines. Um, so with the mRNA vaccines, you have this big little fat bubble and inside it is messenger RNA. And RNA versus DNA, RNA is very flimsy. It's kind of like a, a magazine of information compared to DNA. DNA is like a hard bound book that you know, how back in middle school or grade school, your parents would cover it with, you know, a, a bag to protect it even more. Um, but it's a real solid way to, to store information with DNA. So this RNA virus, it gets into your cell. And then what it does is that RNA just gets translated to just protein. And the protein that comes out looks like part of the, the spike protein of the virus. And that buds its way out of the cell. And then your immune system notices that there's something funky there. It starts to gobble it up and then eventually it's gonna start producing antibodies. So that's not reproducing any part of uh, the active virus. It's only producing what's like part of the fingernail of the virus. <laughs> and it's not going to continually replicate this fingernail forever. So there's no changing of your RNA or there's no changing of your, your DNA because uh, that RNA is just going to fade away in a couple of hours or so. Compared to the viral vector vaccines, this is a, a dead virus. It's uh, a cold virus actually. But within that dead cold virus, the DNA of that cold virus is in there but there's also some of the spike protein uh, DNA. So this is DNA that's actually in there. And this gets into your cell and it goes into your nucleus of the cell, drops off that DNA, and it tells that nucleus to go ahead and start producing the spike protein. 
again. So all of these vaccines, what they do is they tell your body to produce that little fingernail or that spike protein. So that way your body could elicit that immune response. Compared to CRISPR technology, what that does is you get an injection, it has these uh, scissors called proteases. It can cut part of the DNA out and replace it, that strand of, of DNA with uh, a better strand or a crazier strand. And where that works is let's say you have a certain genetic disorder. Well, by getting injected with that, it can find in your chromosomes where that genetic disorder is at, cut that crap out and put in the right DNA and you might be cured. Or let's say in the future, okay, we could fix you to where maybe you're going to have wings now, or <laughs> we're going to turn, make you, you know, into have a boy instead of a girl. And um, so that's where the, the real difference is. This is definitely not CRISPR technology, but CRISPR technology okay. is, is so awesome. For some uh, reason, I thought the, 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 the COVID vaccines were CRISPR based. I didn't. Yeah. But that, yeah, yeah that's what, do, are you seeing any applications of CRISPR in, in what you do? I mean, do you, um, has that made it no, that far? We, <laughs> there was some studies a few years ago that uh, happened in China and they had, a, uh, it was hard to replicate the process, but what they did were they were using CRISPR technology um, to make it to where it was unlikely for you to get infected with HIV. Because um, people in Scandinavia, they have a receptor that they're missing on their um, white blood cells or the, the CD4 cells. And without that special receptor, then you're less likely to get infected. So what the Chinese did was they used CRISPR technology to make it so that way when your body produced these uh, immune cells, they were missing that receptor and therefore wow. these children wouldn't get it. But there was, there might've been some um, side effects associated with that. So it's more something in the making right yeah. now. Yeah, and okay. it's not pro proven to be safe where these vaccines <clears throat> and their technology, uh, they, they are safe and, but, CRISPR-9, I mean, yeah, CRISPR, we're going to be seeing that a whole lot more in the future, and it's going to change everything. And you might even, you might not even know, you might not even have a choice. <laughs> Who knows what the future is going to bring. <laughs> yeah, they put it in Doritos. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, that, that's, that is, that's fascinating stuff to me. So, but, but there is, is there, was there any major shift in our methodology with the new COVID vaccines, or are they just, same old, same old. Uh, I mean, do they resemble a flu vaccine in all other yeah. respects? Okay. Yeah. So actually the Chinese uh, vaccine is more like our traditional type of inactivated yeah. viruses. So it's just a, a, a dead virus kind, kind of technology, but the others are newer. The mRNA ones that are now approved with Pfizer, Moderna, uh, this technology has been out for several years, but it's never actually been successful. Mm. And I think it's really going to change the way that vaccines are made in the future. Because if there's a mutation which causes a variant, you can just fine tune the genetic makeup and then crank out more uh, of the product and, and get people vaccinated. The viral vector vaccines, um, they're just, they're a little bit different from our traditional ones. Um, but but still similar to the inactivated dead viruses that uh, yeah that the Chinese were using. So yeah, we're bringing new technologies into it. That that's what's great about not great about a natural disaster, but anything that's gonna <laughs> shake the planet <laughs> up, uh, we're gonna discover and be pushed to do new things. And certainly. Um, we got some great technology out there and great medical advances because of, uh, of COVID-19. Well, it happened so fast. I mean, I know people are complaining that we don't have it all on the streets yet, yeah. but you know, from 
yeah, from my perspective, anything happening in science or government is going to take forever. Yeah. And now to put those yeah. two things together. <laughs> so that's huge. Yeah, it, it took it from 14 years down to just, you know, a couple of months well, with just in, you know, a couple of weeks, they were able to do the, the sequence and, and ha and have an actual product to start testing in people. It's, it's, it's ridiculous. It's, it is. It's, it's ridiculous. A miracle. It's a miracle. Well, I, and it, what, I mean, the go on my soapbox you know i think it's ridiculous that yeah it get on didn't, it <laughs> didn't well i think it's ridiculous that yeah. it didn't always happen that fast and then yeah. i also think about the other the other elements that COVID has made us rethink like working from home or mm -hmm. yeah. uh, online learning i mean yeah you know I, i've been saying since i was 14 years old i don't need to work in an office <laughs> and, and sure know. enough what, what does the data yeah. show we don't really need yeah. to be in a, so then you think about all the yeah, you because know, one of my biggest pet peeves in life is to drive past these giant office buildings, especially uh, in Richmond or DC. I know. And they're, yeah, with and Capital they're, One, it's they're they're I, lit I up exactly and they're 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 air conditioned twenty four hours a day. There ain't yeah. nobody in yeah. there. So yeah. yeah, if we don't need all that kind of infrastructure, what does yeah. that open up? You know, for and that, that's what we all thought about. Well, at least that's what I thought about first. You know, right when you know, all of this started to happen. There was that novelty. You're like, hmm, there's going to be some great data that comes from this. We're going to like change our, yeah. you know, the CO2 and the environment. <laughs> they do need to look at all this stuff. We're going to get some solid real world data here. But um, now that that's kind of like worn off, but but still like what you're <laughs> saying, I, I feel that the same way. I mean, we can, we saw that we can change things and, and I hope we don't go back. But Right. I'm kind of scared about that with my belief in, you know, new vision of humanity is that it's much like a, a woman um, when they have childbirth, um, it hurts like hell, but, and, but they end up having it again and able to survive <laughs> it again because their body just forgets that's about it. Forgets. That's chemistry. Yeah. <laughs> that's better yeah. living through chemistry yeah. right yeah. there. <laughs> I mean, uh, yeah, my wife had a, uh, a very painful back labor and um, uh, but the body and your mind just kind of forgets it. And I hope that does not happen oh, yeah. you know, with what we learned about with COVID that we go back in a couple of ways or, you know, a generation is only 25 years and we could have another one of these in 25 years or, you know, within 50 years, hopefully not again in our lifetime, but we keep you know, getting into the rainforest and burning things down. We're going to get it with ice caps melting and this and that. We're going to get exposed to new things that may have been hiding out for a long time. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah, it's it's interesting to think what else could happen. But at the same time, we, I mean, we were walking along a year and a half ago, you know, completely ignorant or 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 in denial about something like this happening and I, and on one hand i understand that you don't you don't go around you know expecting to be robbed all the time right you know? right you have to get through life but it seems like maybe we could have had a a defense um against something like this and i, I kept finding myself saying who's responsible you know is it yeah. the who who mm -hmm. makes those rules who says we're going to have a a uh, a defense right. against right. Uh, something like this and people blame trump or or reward trump or whatever but yeah. it just seems like that's a good idea i mean is that something that you do you have a, a, a feeling about that i mean if, if there should be a governing I think, body you know much like everything in medicine here in america i think we're very uh reactive instead of proactive uh, so we had to wait for the crises to develop these um, alarms and and uh, ways to in the in the future to hope keep our eyes um, down the road of what what's going on and even with the mutations and the variants for COVID nineteen America wasn't really you know looking too hard for those compared to other countries which had. Um, you know, a, a better infrastructure for that. That that I think may also boil down to because you know we have a bunch of states and the fundings may be different uh, kind of situation. But 
Yeah, I, I hope certainly now um, we're keeping our eye on things uh, and taking things a little bit more seriously. Uh, the, the, uh, so I'm putting all this together and I get the, I'm, I'm envisioning this, you know, you were talking about bedside manner and how, uh -huh. how, how to communicate um, a scientific finding to a patient, to like an every person, you know, a lay person, maybe there's a way, you know, to communicate the need for these things to mm -hmm. individuals. Cause I still, I, you know, as, as bleak well, as I, I paint things sometimes, I have to believe that if individuals can change and we can all change together, <laughs> you know, that'll roll right. up. <laughs> but I, I don't know. I mean, is that, it gives me hope uh, that that model. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm going to keep trying. Uh, but, you know, damn it. You, you always see somebody just, not wearing their mask or not wearing it appropriately. And it's been a year now, okay? They know the right way to do, <laughs> do it. Do they? See, they <laughs> so so my, my wife they, was just talking about this. I, I just saw the Texas thing. I don't know if you saw this. I mean, when the governor of Texas literally said, we're done. No, we don't, no, we don't need to wear that. masks. We don't, he, he's, he's lifting the mask mandate as of mm -hmm. March mm -hmm. 10th. And so my wife says, um, well, they just, they believe in freedom more than right. they believe in the virus. And I'm like, no, I think they believe the virus is a hoax. I mean, so, right. so where, where, where is it? And, and that's, and this is where I get so frustrated is I don't know what anybody's thinking. Like I used yeah, to be you, able to think, oh, mm -hmm. they're behaving that way because of this or that they're behaving that way. Yeah. And I can sort of explain it away or at least mm -hmm. empathize. Right. Yeah. I, I can't, empathize anymore <laughs> no yeah on this issue and it's driving me nuts because i usually yeah. can i mean it's, do you really think that people value freedom more than they fear getting sick or is it denial or is it um disbelief conspiracy theory <sighs> yeah you, i you think it's it's i th it's it feels like it's all of the above and i'm telling you you don't you don't know or you feel like i'm gonna get punched in the face if i approach this person and i try to tell them to wear their I mask bet. appropriately right um when you're right it's simply hey do you know that that's not a lot of the virus lives in your nose so you're breathing <laughs> it out uh from your nose even if you think you're breathing through your mouth you're going to breathe through your nose a couple of times there. So there's just those misperceptions out there. And we try to do that with visuals, with pictures and things. Um, but it's, it's very, it's, it's um, disheartening, but you know, we, we can't give up. And because if we let that person slide, then, um, you know, we could hurt, someone could get hurt. Um, someone yeah. else could get sick well, and that's the, people I mean, talk that's, about that no go ahead oh, pe people that was my old um kind of argument of why don't you want to get the flu vaccine this year what happens if you may not want it but you're standing in line next to a mother who has a child at home who's getting chemo for their leukemia and now that poor child gets sick because of of uh, you know you spread that infection that way um so again trying to breed empathy and and looking out for our fellow man uh is something that should come natural to you americans but it just doesn't <laughs> well it's, it's just your... like it, it's just like curiosity i mean to me there's a, a couple of traits that i I was just born with. I don't have any other explanation yeah. for that's just how I've always felt. And so yeah. I, know, I know people that don't have that. I'm like, okay, uh -huh. they, they weren't born with it or they didn't have the same opportunities as I did. They didn't develop it or they're just assholes because yeah. I, know, so I know some of these people, especially in the sailing community, there's a bunch of old salty 70 plus year old divorced men out there that mm -hmm. don't give a shit about anything. They would right, literally right. watch that video of the baby dying from the flu and being like, it's not my damn fault. Yeah, you know, so, that's so right. But I don't think they represent, you know, a big part of the population. I, no. I, I, I like to think that's so. 
I, going back to what you were saying, this like that communicating the message, you know, and I'm not saying I do it. I don't, I'm not saying uh, everybody does it their part. Yeah. And, and, and yeah. maybe over time that results in a more curious mm-hmm. population, a more empathetic population. Cause I, I'm with you, man, a hundred percent. Those are yeah. traits that define a healthy world. <laughs> yeah. And not a- whether you're selling car parts or, or drugs or <laughs> trying to get somebody like a, a, a heart that has hepatitis C in, into them um, or the vaccine. It, it's really, can you communicate with enough empathy and take a step back and look to see, you know, why do they, they think that way and, and not get so up in their, in their face? And that's, you know, um, one of the challenges at work that I really love is having that patient who comes off, you know, really upset when they first come and see me, but by the end, we're friends. Well, that's we're, awesome. We're, we're in good standing. So. Nobody got punched. <laughs> yeah, nobody got punched. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's awesome. I mean, this is a cool thing that you get to, one, you live in a, in a very diverse place, a place with a lot of people, so you yeah. probably encounter situations that I, I might run from or you know like yeah. not want to not want to deal head on with the conflict so yeah that's awesome i'm glad that you're strong enough to to be able to do that and sort of yeah. push i've always say i used to teach my students that you know growth happens at our comfort zone and uh-huh. the cool thing about the cool thing about humans is we know when we're at our comfort zone because we start right. to get uncomfortable and yeah. so i would tell them you know when you start getting uncomfortable push through that you know push across yeah. and then i would say and now you have to give a you know a talk for 15 minutes in front of the whole class <laughs> you know? yeah because because that was a great exercise and push them through their comfort yeah. zone but we don't you know maybe maybe that's another element that you know people get so complacent and safe in their own little world and their own beliefs yeah. and yeah um, they don't want to which leads to my next question is do, yeah. do people have to change i mean is there a responsibility in every individual human to do that to to grow or to question their beliefs oh yeah my wife and i um yeah she's um but you were talking about your wife even even evening you out she has definitely done that for me and uh, that's why i think we work so great together and we we talk about this all the time are we able to change are people able to change and we're firm believers that yes if they could again i'm saying it again empathy if they could learn that if they could see where you're coming from or where they're or you could see you know what happened to them historically Mm -hmm. um and you you could maybe change yourself for the benefit for the benefit of everybody and hopefully change that that other person and we just can't sit here and yell at each other forever um (laughs) it it doesn't work for me yeah, we're all going to get like guarded and uh, not be able to, you know, tell our story. So, and, and I think that's kind of where we're headed is, or where, where, where we are. And, yeah, and, and I just say this, me personally, is isolated, not be just yeah. because of COVID, but COVID. So yeah, as, as individual people get more and more isolated from each other that, and um, this is like a, um, a preview of, sort of where, where I've been the last week, I have this idea that says, because you said we're talking about change and people changing uh-huh. and whether that's inherent or not, or if it's an option, mm-hmm. if you think about 200,000 years, well, fuck, uh, however, a bit, uh, several trillion years of evolution, what's yeah. the one constant? Change. You know, what yeah. is the whole, if you, if, if you ask me, DNA was built it was deal with change. And uh-huh. so if we are genetic organisms, and so yeah. but but somewhere along the line, something happened where we said, No, I want stability. I don't want to change mm-hmm. anymore. And so we created all of these artificial illusions of stability, right? And we and we still do that. I I have identity politics. I'm a Democrat, yeah. damn it. And that's yeah. all I'm ever uh-huh. gonna be. <laughs> so it's almost yeah. like we're denying. And then you wonder, well, is that creating more problems than it's solving, or what is that doing? Yeah. And so, yeah. so it's some, somehow I want to formalize the argument that 
we have to change. There's, there's not an yeah. option. And, and you need big events, just like with your DNA through evolution. Evolution either comes because something's trying to eat you or radiation yeah. is hitting your DNA and it's causing right. a mutation. Uh, with COVID-19, it's caused a lot of change in our behaviors. Um, and some people are more resilient <laughs> in not being great, able to change their word. behaviors. And, um, you know, it's going to take them longer or they're just not going to survive if you're talking about, you know, um, evolution there'll be the weaker side that that dies out because they're not willing to adapt and change don't be canceled you know? <laughs> um, <laughs> to put it in the co- the pub yeah the pu- public yeah, vernacular <laughs> yeah i mean i think there's something i think there's something there and, and you know uh, there's there's snippets of that you hear you know it's like what you resist persists mm. and this this whole idea it just hit me lately that we're all fighting really hard which is cascading into a whole bunch of, you, you name the problem. Yeah. And I, and I wonder yeah. to what degree it has to do with resisting change. And then my impatience with the world not changing. And then COVID, yay. Yeah. <laughs> In a way, everything's changed. I love it. Yeah. But I, I, I just think it's, it's, it's difficult because, um, you know, with all the different social media platforms out there, you don't have to change because you could get, find your group and stick with that group and you can feed each other in that group where I, and I think this is just, you know, uh, just part of the evolution of social media is that I would like it to be to a point to where we get past this bubble part to where we, we all can see parts of our own humanity in in each other. Like we all fall down at some point, but I just don't think we're, we're there yet. And I'm really interested to see how it's going to affect my kids as they get up all the TikToks yeah. that they're watching. And um, do they see color anymore? Do they see this as, you know, an African American child or an Asian child here? And is it just all different humans to mm-hmm. them? And is that helpful to them? And I, and I hope it is because they yeah. can, uh, compared to just staying in this political group on, on this social web page or, or that page. Hopefully our children are seeing more diversity than, than we had access to. How old uh, is your oldest? I have a uh, 13 year old son and okay. a um, 10 year old daughter. Yeah. Cause um, my, my oldest is eight. I've got 18, 17 and 14. And I can say a hundred percent, like, I don't know how it's going to affect them in the future, but they, they, it's not like they haven't been affected by race or sexual orientation or any of those yeah. things. They just don't look at that as mattering. Yeah. It's and I ama- think that's it's amazing. But yeah. And I feel like that's what they learned from social media that some of that diversity has, that's the positive thing. Yeah. It just needs to creep out to the older generations or the older <laughs> generations yeah. need to just die out. And hopefully because racism feels like it's, it's bred into our culture uh, and that's by speaking out about racism or speaking out about these negative things that can help the process. But man, it is just so bred in some people that it's Mm -hmm. that generation just needs to pass before we can completely get it out of our system. Well, a buddy of mine says it's just attachment that, that, that people, people, it's not so much the particular, it's the, they are attached to their identity that's tied up with their granddad's beliefs or yeah. you know whatever they grew yeah. up with they, and they yeah. and for me i'm like how could you not one day just go hey that guy wasn't racist to that guy that was cool what's yeah. that about yeah. how could you not like yeah let's wonder, change <laughs> or just yeah just wonder yeah. like hey he's not like me that's cool uh-huh. you know yeah. like 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 you just like listening to what I know about you from an hour, it's like, I want to know yeah. as much as I possibly can about how you do your life. Cause it's yeah. different in the different yeah. ways and, and just yeah. be like, Oh, that's bad. That sounds better. I'm going to try that. Or I, I, yeah. It blows my mind that I can no longer identify with everybody. <laughs> I thought yeah. I had that was my superpower. Yeah. But, but I can't. <laughs> and, and, and that's okay. <laughs> I, 
I, I feel like my opinion about things just changes in, in real time. It's just like, oh, mm-hmm. I can come into a conversation feeling this way and then hear someone else's opinion. Like, Whoa, what? Man. And I think uh, I like that about my myself. And um, but some people just get stuck. Well, it's, it's, and, and I, I hate get to rid be... of that attachment. Yeah. And I, you know, again, I'm not faulting anybody. I get it. Lots of different reasons, but I think it comes down and I hate to be so cliche, but it's Brene Brown and the vulnerability thing. It's mm-hmm. a lot of times things go back to that idea of just being willing to say, I don't know, being willing to be wrong, being willing to share some element of your humanity with another person in a, a as a means of identifying or you know, yeah. finding common ground, all of these things are not things we learn to do in college yeah. or school or our families. And yeah. uh, we, we certainly can. And I think, it, you know, some people do and some people don't, but there's something there that is somehow some antithesis to whatever other movements, you know, the world is going through that are making us more isolated or, or some of the things you said sort of more separate. Um, right. There are, there are these counter movements. There, there's dark matter. <laughs> yeah in our in our universe that's actually light yeah uh, for what that's worth <laughs> what what else did we not get to get to that you wanted to talk about but i'm sure you we both have you know families yeah well this has been a lot of fun for me i mean i could just go and i could see why you find it uh uh very interesting to do because um when you meet a new person, yeah, you just want to, you could keep learning new things and tell your story or um, and just get a different perspective. So I say, just keep on doing it and have <laughs> tons of fun with it. Thanks, man. Well, I mean, um, I, I, I feel bad. It's almost like we say in music sometimes, it's like masturbation. Nobody wants to watch you do it. I mean, good for you. Yeah. But, yeah. but, but it, I, I hope that people that watch this can Mm -hmm. sort of see what what happens and you know learn something from you certainly i mean you you gave us five minutes on vaccines that i think is was awesome that you could do that in real time that fast but then yeah just just knowing that and and for me selfishly i don't i don't get out much (laughs) yeah i what one last thing is um me and my friend we always joke about making uh what's your business idea uh and we come up with just stupid business ideas. But I had one business idea a number of years ago, and I thought it would be like at an airport, is that you're usually traveling by yourself, especially if you're, you know, uh, a business class type of person, and you would go to eat in the, the restaurant there. And wouldn't it be nice to have somebody to talk to you so, so they would have iPads up and you could just oh. pick somebody at another airport or the same restaurant chain to just have a random conversation just like what we're doing yeah the the problem with that is is that you and i we communicated before this like hey i'm interested in meeting (laughs) compared to if you're going to have like a dude you know going to he's gonna it's gonna be like those dating things he's just gonna look for like an attractive woman to have a conversation no but you would it would have to be random i love this and i think dude It'd have to be random and there'd have to be a prompt and you'd have to agree yeah. to, to follow it. Yeah, all you need like, is a prompt. Cause what did we have? Two yeah. text messages. I mean, and yeah. Brian, Brian sort of set it up. I mean, so right. he knew, he knew that there would be chemistry. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I, also, had, we had I also had, I also had like an, a, a party a number of years ago when I heard on NPR of this, uh, it was called, um, it's not Russian roulette. It was roulette something and what it was was uh an internet site to where it was just that you could bring up people and one guy would be djing in his living room the next it would be Hmm. um you know these teenagers hanging out in another room but you know the whole thing was meeting with people all across the world so i was going to have a party to where my tv was up and we could have people around the world join it unfortunately though Every other swipe that you did with this roulette was some guy masturbating on his bed. <laughs> and it was just, you know. Of course. Of course. It was just a dick shot. <laughs> you know? That's terrible. And, well, and that's, that's another great thing. It's like, it's like uh, this guy, another Dan that I interviewed, Dan Fail. Mm-hmm. 
he yeah. said, I was talking about how great COVID was because I figured out Zoom because I yeah. had to figure out Zoom to see my therapist for a regular appointment. And he's yeah. like, yeah, COVID is great. He's like, Get, let me tell you something. Zoom's been around for like five years. <laughs> <laughs> and so as Skype and all these other things that we yeah. never used uh -huh. it for this. Yeah. But now yeah. I think all of a sudden, uh, so another, another good artifact of COVID. I mean, I think more yeah. and more people are doing stuff like this, which is uh, awesome. But so yeah, I can't. A good change. And, and, and another thing I didn't ask you, we don't have to talk about it now. Do you, do you play uh -huh. music? Is that. Um, I don't, I took some piano lessons in my life, but I pressed the keys too hard. Uh, I do love music and listen to music all day at work. Uh, I do uh, some amateur DJing. I oh, sweet. Turntables. Cool. I have right programs on. Uh, on my iPad and on my phone. I'm teaching my daughter how to do it. Awesome. Uh, she's going to be a little DJ. Yeah. Uh, so I love, I have a passion for music in that yeah. way. It really uh, makes me think more clearly. And when it's not on at work, I just get depressed and slow down my productivity. So yes, yeah. you know, it's really important to me. And, and uh, at some point in my life, like if I ever won a trillion dollars, I would definitely take piano lessons every day uh, yeah. to try to master that. It's, you you know. need the trillion time, you need the time for that. Yeah, I need time and I need <clears throat> a couple million. I don't need a trillion. So <laughs> that would be a whole nother philip job that i'd have well yeah and that could be a whole nother interview session or podcast yeah. session because yeah. i think what you just described makes you a musician yeah. you know if, if music th that's what i don't understand it's like whether you play or listen it's really mm -hmm. to the different sides of the same coin right yeah so you probably find that it was piano may be bold try mandolin it's easy yeah <laughs> pick an easy i'll get instrument. brian to help me with that <laughs> yeah. Yeah. awesome well man you know i i haven't seen willie in a long time but one one of these days i'll be up in Richmond yeah and we'll hang great. out and that'll great. be sweet and it's how cool yeah. is it that we met this way That's yeah awesome. this is awesome man and i'll uh i'll um text you and let you know when all this is coming out if you're interested okay and uh, yeah if, sure you know you can it's easier for you to just look for it on my website, but I think it'll probably be okay. like a month. I can't remember okay. All when right. it was in the schedule, but I, I really appreciate you doing it. I had a great time. Yep. Me too. All and right, tell your man. Whole, tell your family. Thanks for giving me I an will. hour of you. <laughs> Yours too. I just, this was, a, to see, this would have never happened if there wasn't COVID because we just, you, you learned all this stuff and we hung out tonight. <laughs> I know. And it's, it's fucking great, man. Yeah. Yep. Thanks, Dan. All right, take care. Yeah, you too. See you, man. <laughs>